So now I think we are ready to look at this out-of-order processor. And I'll first do a basic introduction. Then we'll look at an example to understand what we're trying to achieve with out-of-order execution. And then I'll go back and lay out a few more details. So in this design, the first thing that happens is branch prediction and instruction fetch, right? So this is where I use a hardware sophisticated branch predictor, which has an accuracy of well over, say, 90%. And it tells me exactly what instruction I'm likely to execute next. Once I've made that prediction, I go into my instruction memory unit and fetch as many instructions as I can. And so I bring in maybe four consecutive instructions and those then get placed into what is called the instruction fetch queue. So the instruction fetch queue is a buffer saying that I'm trying to run ahead of where the program is. I'm just going to keep making guesses of what I need to execute next and I'll start bringing in the next set of instructions. Then there is a decode and rename unit which takes these instructions does some renaming, which I've not yet described yet, and then it places those instructions into two different structures, the issue queue and the reorder buffer. Let's first look at the issue queue. So each instruction over here gets renamed and then placed into the issue queue. And the issue queue is the smarts in this design. It's able to analyze whether instructions depend on each other or not, right? So what I'm trying to do over here is, in the past, I was looking at only one instruction at a time, right? I was only looking at the oldest instruction and trying to execute it, right? So my decode unit would look at this oldest instruction, see if that instruction is ready to progress. If it is ready to progress, then I let it move into the ALU units. If it's not ready to progress, I kind of hold it back over here. And correspondingly, all the instructions after that first instruction also get held behind, behind that first instruction. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm saying that while I'm analyzing this first instruction, let's bring in the next set of instructions as well, right? So I want to try and look at the next 20 instructions or the next 50 instructions. And so I look at this large pool of instructions. If this first instruction is not ready to execute and not ready to, to progress into the next pipeline stage, then I look at these other instructions and see if one of them can actually go ahead and execute, right? So we are relying on the fact that these instructions after that first instruction don't always depend on the first instruction, right? If they all depended on this first instruction, then there's nothing you can do. Everybody has to wait behind that first instruction. But there's a really good chance that if you look at the next, say, 50 instructions, you will find a few instructions over here that don't depend on the older instructions and are ready to issue in this very next cycle. So it is the issue queue that does all of that magic. And it tries to say that, you know, I'm going to look at the next 50 instructions. In any given cycle, I'm going to analyze all of these instructions figure out which instructions have all the registers that they need in order to execute. And those instructions are going to be picked and then sent off to the ALU units. So these instructions all go ahead, execute in parallel. I'm trying to do a lot of things at the same time, right? So this is a hardware intensive approach to get high performance. That's why I fetched multiple instructions in any given cycle. I'm decoding and renaming multiple instructions and putting it in the issue queue. And likewise, I'm trying to find multiple instructions that can leave the issue queue and can start executing on the ALUs all in the same cycle. So these instructions execute, they finish. Once they've produced a result, what they want to do is write their results into the register file. But like we talked about earlier, you don't want instructions to complete out of program order. So when they finish, they want to store their results in some temporary storage unit, right? So they all write their results into this temporary storage over here. So what is the structure? This is called the reorder buffer it remembers the order in, in which instructions entered the pipeline. So the decode unit is processing instructions in program order. And as it puts instructions into the issue queue in program order, it also places them in program order into the reorder buffer, right? So I know that the first entry is occupied by instruction one, followed by the second instruction in program order, followed by instruction three and so on. So as instructions finish in the ALU, they go back here and say, well, I was instruction four, I now have my result. It's not yet time for me to put it into the register file because I want values to be placed in the register file in program order. So for now, I'm just going to write my result into this temporary storage. Since instruction four occupies the fourth entry, it has a special storage dedicated for it called T4. So I'm going to put my result into T4. And over time, when it is my turn to commit, I'm going to copy the value in T4 into the register file and make that result permanent. Okay, so now that you've kind of understood what this out-of-order processor is doing, let's look at an example and then I'll come back to this and explain some more details.